youth, they get this big blast from the Lord and come home and just sit again. And so um, that's a that's a big investment for parents to send their kids. They don't, you know, they want them to come home and use that excitement. And so come home and start teaching Bible studies right away. If you wait, uh, you know, I, I have this book called No Can Do. It's K-N-O-W. And um, it's, a, it's basically about how we gain so much knowledge, but we do nothing with it. And so um, the book is about you don't need another book. You don't need another conference. You don't need another seminar. You don't need, uh, you, you need to start learning to use what you already know. Because um, so many times people will invest an awful lot into going to a conference or a seminar or some kind of a training or something. The corporate world, this is it's a corporate book. It's not, it's not a Christian book. It's a corporate book. Um, Ken Blanchard wrote it. He, he writes a lot on leadership things. But, but uh, he writes to the corporate structure, not necessarily to the church structure. But uh, but a lot of it, um, he he is a professing Christian, so um, so he mixes faith in with it. But uh, but it's it's not designed um, for Christianity. It's designed for everyone. And so anyway, <clears throat> he uh, he talks about how you go to all these different things, and and uh, and if you go home and you don't implement any of it, that. Within a month, you have forgotten 90% of what you spent all that money and all that time to learn. That's amazing. If you don't use it right away, within a month, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. I wonder how that does translate into church. If we don't use what we get at church, we lose what we get at church. Hmm, Just a thought, just a thought. James chapter 2, verse 23, let's go there, and it's great to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's good to see Vang back. It's good to see Al back. It's good to see Jessica. It's good to see Hannah. Haven't seen Hannah for a few weeks. Hannah's growing up, and she's going to be driving soon. You're not driving yet, right? Good. <laughs> Christina turned 18. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May you feel, help me out. Every day of the year, a happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. And the best year you've ever had. Now, everybody, remind her, those of you who are over 18, remind her, 18 means nothing. It doesn't mean you're an adult. Don't worry. It means you can vote, but that's about it. <laughs> uh, there's there's nothing, nothing great about 18, is there? And, uh, and so, okay, James chapter 2, 23, thank you for standing. We are going to read just one verse, just one verse, and we're going to break down, we're going to, and we're going to read a few extras later on, but, uh, but this is all we're going to use for a text. And the scripture was fulfilled. Which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. The scripture was fulfilled that said that. So, in other words, Abraham was, did, become the friend of God. The scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Okay, I'm going to talk about Abraham's altars this morning. We're going to break down four altars that Abraham um, built and... uh, and we're going to talk about Abraham's altars. Uh, it's a good thing to to study altars. Not really, you know, the construction of an altar, but the importance of it, the timing of it, the uh, 
the necessity of it. And so let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, you are so great and wonderful. We do love and praise you this morning. We ask you, God, to help us as we teach through the Scripture, as we learn the Scripture. Help us, oh God, to put it in our lives. Put it in what the old-timer said, shoe leather, Lord, and walk with it. We give you praise and adoration today in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. The, uh, <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce back and forth to the amplified version this morning. How many of you have an amplified version of the Bible? Just a couple? Okay. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty good version of the Bible. But, uh, but you have to go back to the King James to really get, um, because there's, th- there are a few things in the Amplified that uh, it just kind of make you turn your head and say, huh, what? But, um, uh, but so yeah, yeah, you can't just take that um, in and of itself. However, it does, um, one thing I like about the, the Amplified is it puts a definition a lot of times right in the verse. It uh a lot of times, instead of instead of you having to go back to the Greek or the Hebrew or going to a dictionary and try to find the definition of a word, a lot of times it takes words that that uh, uh, deem defining right there to uh, expound on the meaning. It puts the definition right in the verse. So so that's one thing I I do like about it. So James two twenty three from the Amplified says, and so the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed in. Now, here's the definition, adhered to, trusted in, and relied on God. And this was accounted to him as righteousness, and another definition, as conformity to God's will and thought and deed. And he was called God's friend. So there's two factors that, um, that really uh, created this deep friendship with God. And um, the first factor was he believed pretty Good, huh? I mean, doesn't seem to be that deep of a thought. It's really not that deep of a thought. But it's a thought that so many people struggle with. Because they split their beliefs in so many different things. They believe a little of this, a little of that. They believe some of that and and maybe none of that. They, 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 They divide their beliefs. And... um that can be dangerous when it comes to God. And so the Amplified used the word, uh, used to define the word believed is adhered to, trusted in, or relied on. Believe, believe in is much more an active word. It's an active word. It's a verb. Yeah, that, that's another thing that a lot of people don't really grasp is that believing is a verb. So, um, for all of us who are, you know, kind of short on our elementary grammar, a verb means it demands action from a noun. I, I've used this statement many, many times. It's a simple statement. But how many people have ever heard somebody say, I believe in God? Anybody ever heard that? Okay. So, just that very statement alone demands action from the person making that statement. Demands action. And otherwise, there's no belief. If they're not acting on the things of God, they're not really believing in God. And it it really sheds a lot of light on the Scripture that says... (laughs) Let God be true, and every man a... Well, don't we hate that? Because if we're not acting and, and doing the things of God, then we're not really believers. We're not believing in God. And so, be careful about the, the, the ways that you use the word believe, because it's going to demand action from you. Uh, it, it, believe it is is an active word. It's uh, it's not just a mental attitude. See, we we tend to think that believing is just a mental attitude. No, it's uh, it's an active word. Um, it, it, it's amazing because you 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 know what uh, what Muslims believe. 
because they're acting on it. They're acting on what they believe. You have really no doubt what they believe because you see their actions. But does the world know what Christians believe? You know, the word is, means it's clinging to, it's leaning, it's trusting, it's depending on God. It's resting in God. It's true belief and faith that's truly faithful. The second factor in this uh, is that it's righteousness, which is defined in the Amplified as um, conformity to God's will in thought and deed. How many of you know the complete will of God for your life? Wow, how come nobody raises their hand? You know your complete, the complete will of God? Well, yeah, that's, that, that'll sum it up. I mean, what about what, where we're supposed to go tomorrow? What's the will of God? Who we're supposed to talk to? You know, uh, d- different, different things we're supposed to do. You know, we, we, we struggle with that will of God. But if we're believing in God... We're going to, the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, Lord, right? So if we're believing in God, we're acting on our beliefs, the will of God is going to play out whether we really pay attention to it or not. You'll wake up and say, wow, I guess that was the will of God. I didn't even, I didn't even realize it. You know, we, we, we find out that the will of God happens through simple believing and walking with him. And the Bible said for Abraham, it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was imputed unto him for righteousness that he believed in God. So we know that he walked in the direction that the Lord sent him in. We read that where he called him out of the land of Ur, the Chaldees, and says, you just get going. I'm going to show you a land. I'm going to give you a land. And, And so he just took off walking in the direction. He didn't know where he was going. He just knew the direction he was headed. And, and so he, he just believed in God. He just heard the voice of the Lord. He just paid attention to the voice of the Lord. He just obeyed the, the voice of the Lord. And it was imputed unto him as for righteousness. Because his life conformed to the will of God simply through his life of believing. You didn't realize it was that simple, did you? We tried to figure out the results and the answers and everything, and sometimes we just completely forsake the walk. We completely forsake the journey. We get frustrated along the journey because we're, we're so busy trying to figure out the answer. You know, it's, um, it, it's kind of like a test. You know, the answers are, are in the book. But if we don't read the book, when, by the time we take the test, we're just going to be scrambling trying to figure out the answer. But if we read the book, the answers just come naturally. We recognize uh, we we recognize in, in a in a test when when a sentence is out of order because we've read the material right. Anybody ever recognize when when something's just a little out of order in your life because you've read the material? You've read the material, so when the test comes, you, you already know, uh, they're trying to trick me here. You know, if, if more of us would, would read the material closer, we wouldn't get so bogged down with the world because we'd recognize it immediately. 
what some people don't figure out for 20, 30, 40 years, we would figure out quickly if we just read the material. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. It's December. You're, we've got new bread charts. We're, you know, we're going to promote Bible reading again. We want you to read your Bible through next year. There's a chart that will help you. There's a ton of different apps that you can get now if you have smartphones or tablets or anything. You can, you can download an app, and, and you, you can even have the Bible read to you now. I mean, that's just crazy, right? You can be driving down the road just listening to it. I mean, the, the Word of God is, is, is so accessible to us. Don't just leave it lay. So conformity to God's will in thought and in deed. Uh, this speaks of obedience and submission. Abraham trusted and relied on God. He also conformed and was obedient to God's thoughts and deeds. Psalm 37 says, fret not thyself. Trust in the Lord and do good. I'm, I'm bouncing different verses. But delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy ways, thy way unto the Lord, he, and trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself. Uh, read and pray Psalm 37. It's a good one. It's a good one. Trust and obedience. It's two characteristics that made Abraham friend of God. So, okay, from the message, let's read James 2.23 from the message. Um, it says, the full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, um, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's that mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. There's an obedience and a conformity. How we... It's action. It's action. Um, we, we don't really like obedience until we're parents, and then we, we want our children to do it. But, but we recognize the importance of it. We recognize the importance of obedience because when we obey, we are set in the proper direction. And the older we get, we're already going in the right direction. We don't have to we don't have to question it. We're already set in the right direction. Uh, Proverbs tells us, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old he will not depart from it. Why? Because they're already on the right track. If we learn to obey the scripture, you're gonna you're gonna outwalk an awful lot of mess. We're going to outwalk an awful lot of it. But if we disobey the scripture, we're going to keep trudging through the mess. And so it's, it's, it's nice. Just, the, the Lord said obedience is better than sacrifice. Who did he say that to? And he said it to Saul, right? He said it to Saul because Saul was commanded to destroy everything the Amalekites had everything because the Amalekites had turned so much against God's people. In fact, the Amalekites, when the children of Israel were coming across the desert in the Exodus, the Amalekites came up behind the children of Israel and started to slaughter their women, their children, and their flocks. They wouldn't even go. They, they didn't even fight the men of Israel. They went after their kids and their wives and their flocks. The Lord said, enough's enough. These people, I've given them more than ample time to repent. Clean them out. And the Lord told Saul everything, everything. But Saul found some stuff that he kind of liked. Well, you know, and, and this is how this is how Saul justified it. Because when, when Samuel, the prophet, comes walking into the camp, he says, he, he says, have, have you obeyed the Lord? Well, you, yeah, we, we obeyed him, we obeyed him, yeah, home, yeah, home. He says, then what meaneth the bleeding of these sheep? Hold up. I hear sheep bleating. Yeah. 
<laughs> what, why am I listening to this? Why am I hearing this? And Saul's so dumb. He says, well, I thought maybe we could keep it and sacrifice it to the Lord. Are you kidding? All the Amalekites and everything they have is a sacrifice unto the Lord. And so Samuel gets so irate because he doesn't just hear the bleeding of the sheep, but he also finds Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Saul was keeping him as a trophy. You are my prisoner. Samuel gets so mad simply because of Saul's disobedience. He gets so mad, Calvin. You know what he does? He grabs Saul's sword and lops Agag's head off. Whew. Good thing he didn't lop off Saul's head. But Saul lost his kingdom that day. That's probably worse than lopping his head off, actually. The humility he had to endure because his kingdom has departed from him. But the preacher got so mad he slaughtered Agag. Don't get me mad. <laughs> Don't worry, I wouldn't do that to you. I'd do it to Lou. Just kidding. <laughs> I, I would not do anything like that. But, but imagine, imagine that and the Samuel said to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. You're thinking you're going to sacrifice yourself into favor with God. Obedience brings favor with God. The, the Bible is filled with sacrifices that the Lord did not accept. but it's never filled with an act of obedience that he did not accept. You'll never find an act of obedience that the Lord refused. But you'll find sacrifices that he did. Because obedience can't be done with a twisted heart. True faith, true obedience. It's taking action to be like God, to be obedient to God. One of the problems that, that you'll find with Lot and the reason that Lot was found to have pitched his tent towards Sodom was because Lot was never an altar builder. When's the last time you read that Lot built an altar? Won't find it. It's harsh. I mean, Lot is a nephew to Abraham. Abraham is carrying him. Abraham delivered him out of idolatry. Lot came with Abraham. Abraham delivered him out of idolatry, brought him into the land that flowed with milk and honey, brought him into a land that was, that, that was empty of idolatry and only God was there. And yet we don't see Lot ever building an altar. So four major instances we're going to look at this morning um, as a result um, that, that, that where Abraham built altars. As a result of these altars, Abraham was trusting, he was conforming, he was believing. The difference between Lot and Abraham was that Abraham was an altar builder. Uh, look, look at each one of Abraham's four altar building experiences. We're going to take a look into the context in which each one of these took place. Um, so let's, let's look and see what, uh, what, what brought this man into becoming, to, to, to being called the friend of God. I don't know about you, but I, I think it's great if the Lord would call me his friend. That's pretty good. I mean, he's still God. He's still God. I still treat him like God, but, but for God to call me his friend, I think that's a pretty incredible thing. So if we'll follow Abraham's steps, 
believing, conforming. And, and if we'll build the same altars that he built, we'll also be called the friend of God. So, so Hebrews tell, tells us that we have, we have an altar. Now, an altar today, it's not a pile of rocks. It's not a bunch of stones. It's not an animal sacrifice. Um, um, you know, we, we do uh, call this the altar up here. And yes, it was, it was built for a place of prayer and, and consecration. And, and yes, this, that, the other. But, but, but an altar is going to be more of a devotion for you. It, it's, going to be, it, it's going to be many times it's going to be invisible. It's going to be your commitment. It's going to be your level of commitment. It's going to be, it's going to be you walking down the street and, 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 and all of a sudden tuned into the voice of the Lord and, and hearing the voice of God and, and doing the things of God. And yes, we have a, a physical structure that we come to and we pray at, and, and that's wonderful and that's great, but, but more so when we leave the physical structure, we have got an invisible altar within us that we have to attend to. You cannot, you, you cannot only hear the voice of God at church. You've got to grow beyond this physical structure and you've got to hear the voice of God every day, wherever you are. And, uh, and that means that you've got, to, you've got to tune into that voice. You've got to call on that name. You've got to be led by the Spirit. If many of us are led by the Spirit, Walk in the Spirit. As many walk by the Spirit or walk in the Spirit or led by the Spirit. So we, we, we have to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen, amen? Amen. So if we don't build altars in our lives, we'll not find success or a forward thrust in our walk with God. Um, and so a- Abraham's four experiences. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. And if you want to turn there, that's fine. Um, I, will, um, I will read from there. If you want to turn there, that's great. It, it, I, I think it deems um, a uh, necessity to put a note in these passages of Scripture because you are going to need these altars somewhere in your walk with God. You're going to need these altars. And so I have no problem at all underlining and writing notes in my margin. I have no problem at all. Somebody took the liberty to to put chapters and verses and headings in my Bible before I bought it. So I have the liberty to underline Scripture right in my margin and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. You're not changing anything. You're not adding to or taking away. You're writing a diary, so to speak. You're adding your own notes. Your notes are not going to be more powerful than the Word of God itself. So... Um, but how cool would it be for in a hundred years from now, if you're gone and the Lord hasn't taken us yet, for somebody to pick up your Bible and read those notes, those devotions of yours? Pretty cool stuff, huh? So, chapter twelve, verses six and seven. And Abram passed through the land under the place called Sychem, and unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. One of the most important parts of this altar is the location. Somebody say location, location, location. Location, location, location. You know, That sells billions of dollars a year in real estate. But what would it do personally to you to have a location for your altar? Here he is in the, unto the place of Sychem. Sychem means a place of burdens. Moray means a teacher. So Abraham built his altar between a place of burdens and a teacher. When Abraham's carrying the burdens and the load of moving to what we call the promised land, the Bible calls the promised land, as God called him to do, all the logistics and difficulties of that job entailed, he was carrying some heavy burdens. I don't, I don't, I don't know about you, but... <clears throat> But um, 
if, if, if I was to pack up my family and move across a desert, I don't have U-Haul. I don't have an airplane. I don't have a C-130. I don't have a helicopter. I have a camel and my feet and a donkey. (laughs) And I am going to be moving across the desert. I have no address to GPS. I can't plug it into my GPS and follow an address. Okay, this is the route you take. I don't have I don't have a map. All I have is the Lord saying, "Go this way." <laughs> Do you think that might be a little wearisome? You think that might be a little bit of a burden? I mean, he doesn't have any kids at this point, but he does have Sarai, and we know she's a laugher. He has his wife, and he has his nephew, and, and, and Lot has a wife, and, and I don't know if Lot has any kids at this point or not. He has kids somewhere down the line. We see kids, but, uh, but he has his servants. He has his flocks. I mean, Abraham did not show up at the promised land with just Lot, Sarai, and a goat. He had flocks. He left with some wealth. He did not, he did not walk across the desert empty-handed. So he, he's responsible for his caravan, not a dodge. He's responsible for his family. He's responsible for his servants. He's responsible for, 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 for his flocks. He's responsible for all this, and he has no address. He doesn't know where he's going. He just knows when he'll get there. Now, how many of you would be willing to do that? Life was fat in the land of Ur. He wasn't in a famine. He was in a wealthy place. He wasn't wasn't in a desert in Ur. He was in a wealthy place. In fact, he was in a place where where we get billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of oil today. He was in a wealthy place. So how many of us would truly be willing, if we heard from God, to leave all of our wealth and just start walking? And the further you go, the hotter it gets, the more desert it gets, and you're just trying to think, are you serious, God? Um, it doesn't seem to be getting any better here. And then he gets to Sycam. Now, Sycam um, is, is, is a, is a uh, mountainous area. But once you got over the mountains, because Mount Mora is Moray or whatever, I don't know what you call it. Mount Mora is there, but but then once you get over the mountain, you get into this plain area. And the plain area seemed to be pretty nice. But you had to get over the mountain first. And the mountain wasn't very nice. I mean, you look this up uh, geographically and topography, top, top, topologically, is that how you say it? No, it's, it's a good word. I don't know if it's the right word, but um, you, you look this up and you look at it and you're like, wow, this is kind of an ugly area. Um, beautiful from the sky, but if you get down on, on level ground and you start looking around and the Lord says, you're going to the other side, huh? <laughs> And you look at all the stuff you're taking with you. Are you kidding? No. 
You're at a place of burden. And there's a teacher there. Uh Uh-oh. Can the Lord teach us something when we are so overwhelmed with burden? The truth is, that's when he has the best opportunity to teach us something. Is when we are so overloaded with burden that we have to shut everything else off and find an altar. Abraham built an altar. He's looking at the mountains. He doesn't, he, he doesn't really know there's a plane yet. Um, he doesn't, doesn't really know there's one. But, but he's looking at the altars and um, he just, okay. Or he's looking at the mountains. And he's okay, okay, well, I guess I better build an altar because I don't know if I'm really supposed to go over and through this. It could just be that I'm done right here. But he wasn't done. You ever feel like the mission that you're created for created more burdens in your life? It's a hard thing to be taught by burden, to be taught by mountain climbing, to be taught by responsibility. But it's a necessary thing. The good news is you were designed for it. You're not mountain goats, but you were designed to carry a load. But while you're carrying that load, you've got to recognize the necessity that that load is going to teach you a lesson. 1 Peter 1.6 tells us, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold tent temptations. Then verse 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now the Amplified tells us this. It says, you should be exceedingly glad on this account. Though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith, which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold, which is tested and purified by fire. This proving of your faith is intended to redound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, is revealed. Uh Uh-oh. Now, the Amplified says that your faith is intended to get you through this but it's not intended to make life easy. Abraham had an easy life, but do you you know the reason he called him out of that easy life? It wasn't because his life was easy. It was because he was wrapped around on all sides by idolatry. It wasn't because Abraham was wealthy that the Lord said, leave Ur, get out of town, go west, young man, or east, I guess he would have been going. It wasn't, it wasn't because, because he had such problems and, and he was distressed and he was discouraged. It was because everywhere he turned was idolatry. And the Lord said, Abram, get out now. And Abram was wise enough to say, if I don't pay attention to the voice of God now, I'm never going to get out of this idolatry. So when we hear the voice of God, we've got to get out now. The 
key word in verse 6 is distressed. And the key word in verse 7 is genuineness. The message says it this way. It says, I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved. Pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved. Genuine. When the Lord wraps this all up, it's your faith. It's not gold that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. I think that's a great thing. That the Lord says, I want your faith displayed. I don't want your gold displayed. I want your faith displayed. I want your walk with God. I want your concentration, consecration rather. I want your commitment. I want your faithfulness. I want your faith displayed. How many of you have been through the fire and been through the flood, but we're still in the church triumphant? We still have a great God. So what is the reason for this heaviness? As the Amplified says, the distress. To purify your faith, to try us, to teach us some things about ourselves and about the kingdom of God. The the great thing about trials, if there is anything good about trials, is it tells you where you're at in your walk. You can't hide it. It tells you right where your victories are, and right where your failures are. And the Lord says, you're going to keep your victories, and you're going to overcome your failures. Puts you right there. You know, we we all hate taking tests. I hated taking tests. I still don't really care for taking a test. Uh, I I don't get this test anxiety. Anybody ever get test anxiety? I don't don't know. I, I don't know if it's a real thing or not. I think it's just... I think it's just we get nervous, but but it, people get all anxious and stuff about a test. But but uh, but but the crazy thing is, nobody likes a test, but everybody likes to pass one. And what did your teachers tell you when you got something wrong on your test? Did they shoot you and kick you and and, and throw you in the corner and, and and tell you you were stupid? No, they said, well, now at least you know what to work on. You know, you know your areas to study now. And the Lord's saying the same thing. When you have a failure, now you know what areas to work on. Amen. Now you know what areas. It, it, it's amazing to me. People keep failing God and say, I don't know what to pray about. <laughs> really? Are you kidding me? Why don't you pray about all those things that you're down and out about because you keep failing God? That'd be a good place to start. I just get down to pray and I just don't ever know what to pray about. And then in the same conversation, they say, I just keep having the same problem over and over again. If we, if we paid attention to half the stuff we said, we would have a prayer list way too long to attend to. It's, it's amazing to me. People say, I don't know what to pray about. I, I just can't think of anything. Wow. It, it, that, that just blows me away. Heaviness. The, the Greek word is lupeo, I think. That's what it's looks like to me it means to distress or to be sad or to cause grief or to grieve or to be sorrowful or to make sorry you know the amazing thing is um the the greek word heaviness is that it's it's an active word that when you're in heaviness you are causing distress you are caught not you're the one that's distressed But now you're turning around and you're causing distress. You're causing, to cause grief. To make sorry. Anybody ever uh, unintentionally make somebody feel sorry for you? Or is it always, always intentional? 
You say, well, I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me. But then you go on and you tell the story. and you know, Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but, but people will feel sorry for you. Don't feel bad about that. If people feel sorry for you, just accept it. We, we should have a little more compassion on one another. Some things we ought not feel sorry for you over because you're doing it out of ignorance. And, well, just sometimes it's just plain stupidity. But this word heaviness means that because you're feeling heavy, you're transferring it. Mm. It's a sad situation. We're, we're designed to carry some heaviness. We are designed to carry it. Now, it, 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 it teaches us some things, though. It's precisely where Abraham was. He was between Sychem, a place of burdens, and the plain of Mori, a teacher. He was between this. God was teaching him as he was carrying those burdens. The next time you're carrying a heavy load, instead of shutting down, shutting off, finding a corner to cry in, you can do all of that too, but find an altar. Build an altar. And take it to the Lord. Because if you don't build an altar this time around, you're not going to learn the lesson and the next time around, uh-oh, you mean it's going to happen again? Oh, yeah. People ask me, why do I keep going through the same thing over and over and over again? I say, because you haven't learned the lesson yet. You know, people that are in seventh grade for 10 years haven't passed. Pass and go to eighth grade. Right, Lou? It's always better. No, he no, he's just too busy talking. So you got you gotta get through. If you stay in the same I, I, I worked with a kid that he well, I worked for his mom, but this this kid was in the seventh grade four times. Four years in a row. You know, you, you can you can laugh, but he was the largest seventh grader I've ever seen. The only way he got to eighth grade is because he said, I'm going to have my driver's license and still be in seventh grade. So his mom said, you're going to live with your dad. So he did. And I see him when he's 20 years old. And I'm not kidding you. He's 20 years old. He was in the 11th grade. And I said, wow, man. That's incredible. I don't know anybody who's still a junior in high school and 20 years old. I think you should be in the Guinness Book of World Records. He says, I'm going to graduate when I'm 21. He says, but I'm graduating. I'm determined. Wow, by 21, you better be determined to graduate high school. God's teaching. So what's the point? What's the point? How did he respond when Abraham had this burden? How did he respond? He could have responded by saying it's too heavy. It's too difficult. Uh, There's no way in the world I'd ever get through this. But he didn't. He built an altar. He built an altar. He gathered stones together. Now, the way they built an altar was not, you know, it required something. They would gather, they would spend time building an altar. Well, I think one of the I, I think one of the things that we lack today is we look for everything ready made. We 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 have to our our meals have to be done in a microwave. Everything has to be ready made for us. When he built an altar, he went and gathered stones. And he built up stones. And uh, regardless of what you think it looked like, 
it was basically a big fire pit. Because on top of that, he would put a sacrifice and it would all be engulfed with flames. We already have the Lamb of God. We already have the the Holy Ghost and fire, the fire of His Spirit within us. We don't need us. We don't need a lamb, and we don't need fire. We just need to get to the altar. Everything else is already there. But he, he, he made a commitment. He worshiped God. He sacrificed. This is, a, this is the stuff that made Abraham a friend of God. Amen. He didn't look for a ready-made altar. He built one. He built one. Amen. What did Abraham do? What did he built an altar. Many of you are between a place of burden you're, you're struggling, you're having a hard time, but God is saying, build an altar, build an altar. He's not saying throw in the towel, give up on life, just, just forsake everything that you've worked for. He's not saying that. He's saying, build an altar. It works, church, it works. It's obvious when people are in a place of burden, isn't it? Amen. It's obvious. You can, you can tell it on people. You know, we, we can only put on so many masks before, before we're out of masks. But instead of criticizing people for their place of burden, why don't you help them? Hey, we have an altar. Let's get there together. Learn lessons that God's trying to teach us. Past the seventh grade, so to speak. Get moving. Build your altar. Move forward. People get stuck in a rut. People get stuck most of the time because they don't build altars. Most of the time, the reason we're stuck is because we're not building an altar. We want everything ready made. Oh, we'll, we'll pray, but we'll pray out of desperation. An altar isn't always a place of desperation. An altar is a place where you take some time at and you tune into the voice of God. You put some commitment into. You, 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 you put everything out. Uh, Abraham did not go over that mountain until first he got the instructions at that altar. It didn't take five minutes. It took a little time. So don't allow life to get you stuck. It's a whole lot better to to walk beyond your burdens than to get stuck trudging around in them. Altar number two, and I probably won't get any further than that today. Genesis 12, 8, verse 8 says, And he removed from thence, where, where did he go from? He went from Sychem, he went from the land of Morah. He, he removed from thence unto a mountain, another mountain, on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east, and there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Mm. Okay, well, what did he do at the first altar? We, we understand what he did there. He was, he, he was heavy and he needed direction. The Lord appeared unto him. <clears throat> now, he's at another mountain, it's Bethel. Bethel is what some people call it. It's Hai, right there near Hai. There he built it an altar. Where was this place? The Bible says the east side of Bethel. Now, Bethel means the house of God. Or Bethel, if you want to call it. But on the other side of the house of God was a place called Hai. Now, Hai means a ruins. 
Hei, by the way, is also Ai when you when you see the children of Israel coming out of, well, entering in, after, right after Jericho, they went to Ai next. It's the uh, same place. <laughs> so in the first instance, Abe ha- was in a place of burdens, which was a teacher to him. Uh, and he built an altar. He went on with his progress. Past the seventh grade, if you want to say it that way. Now he's between the house of God and the ruins. Now, let's, let's try to take a look and see what, what that talks to us about. It tells us even though he was faithful to God and to the things of God, he was going through some ruins of difficulty and trial. He was faithful to God. He was consistent. He was committed to God. But his life was still, everything that he had, he was still facing the ruins. Does anybody ever... Walk out of the house of God into a ruins. In the day that we live, it happens probably every service. Where we step out of the house of God and we head right back into a ruins. It's not always our house. So some houses probably look like a ruins, but, but uh, it's not always our home. It's not always a marriage. It's not always your children. Sometimes it's your job. Sometimes it's just a struggle of financial distress. But, but there's a ruins always present somewhere in our life. We can, we can come to the house of the Lord. We can get jacked up, filled with the Holy Ghost. We can worship. We can dance. And it's a good time. And it's a fantastic time. And it's in the will of the Lord most of the time. That you get spiritually saturated is always in the will of God. That he just always just, just zaps you spiritually and fills you because he knows you're going to face trial. He knows you're going to face struggle. He knows you're going from the house of the Lord into a ruins. He knows it. That's why he wants to bless you every time you're here. That's why he wants to pour into you, pour himself into you every time you're here. That's why he wants to he he wants to get you excited about the things of God because the ruins is ever before us. And if we don't have God with us, the ruins are going to consume us. So we need the Lord. Hey, we, we, oh, things, you ever see things just ruining all around you? When, when, when the Lord increases us, the Lord revives us, the Lord strengthens us, and, and yet it still seems like things are falling apart. They are. The world is not getting better. So the people of God have to. Because the world is not. It's still trashing itself. It's still degrading itself. It's still living only for itself. So the people of God have got to be the warriors on the front lines. The world isn't going to save itself. We've got to reach them. So we will leave the house of God, walk into a ruins, but look for somebody to pull out. Stage two and Abe's process of development, if you will. Oh, you didn't realize that Abraham, a full-grown man, had to develop. You thought he was perfect. You thought since he was called by God that everything was perfect and everything was absolutely great because he was called by God. Are you kidding? Abraham didn't get good until he got 
after the process. Hearing from God does not perfect us. We've got to start doing. Abraham gets out in the middle of this desert. Ah, what's going on? He uh, he was probably bald by the time he got there, just pulling his hair out in chunks. Who knows? But but, uh, stage two, What, what are you going to do, Abraham, when you're faithful to the house of God, to the things of God, you're living right. You're doing everything that God wants you to do. And yet there's a disintegration going on nearby. A coming apart of some things that you have held dear, a ruins. Hey, I also could be interpreted as a heap of ruins. It wasn't just a place of ruins. It was a heap of ruins. It's a city east of Bethel, besides Bethaven near Jericho. Um, I already mentioned Jericho was the first place is when Israel invaded Canaan that they were destroyed. Hey, I was a second city. So, so here is Abraham again. Um, what are we going to do? Because Abraham's our father too. Amen. It, you know, the Old Testament is very powerful in the fact that everything that physically happened to all of these people is spiritually going to happen to you. Sometimes even physically, but for sure spiritually. God is going to put you through some things. If you want to be great for God, you're going to have to go through things to make you great. It's easier not to build an altar, sure, but it's safer to build it. Because if you don't build an altar, you'll perish. It's always easier not to trust God. It's it's easier just to quit and run. It's easier to 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 give up, but but ease is not the life we live. Because if it's not God challenging you, it's going to be sin challenging you. You can't get drunk enough. You can't get stoned enough. It'll kill you. You can't get immoral enough. It'll destroy you. But you were designed for greatness. You were created to be the image of God. You weren't created just to be a bump on a log, or you weren't you weren't created to be a, a monkey flying from tree to tree. You were created to be the image of God. You were designed to be an overcomer, designed to be great, designed to be powerful. You were designed to have dominion over the earth and everything in it. You were designed for that. So if we were designed for that, then the only place we're going to find that training, if you will, is by God doing it. And he is not, he's not going to drag you through the muck and the mire just to kick you later on and say, you're stupid, you can't make it. No, he is going to, yeah, there's going to be muck and mire, but he's always going to be pulling us through it. He's always going to be pulling us through. You're going to walk into the mess all by yourself. He's going to be on the other side pulling you through. Verse 8 says, and there he building an altar, right right there, where life looked tough and life looked unfair. He built an altar 
of commitment, sacrifice, worship. He built an altar. He qualified himself to move and to continue in his journey. He didn't say, enough's enough, God, I give up. There's no way in the world I can do this. I'm just going to sit right here in Bethel. I'm not going to pass through Hai. There's no way in the world I'm going through that. I already went through Sycam. I, I, I already got through that. I already carried and lugged the burden over the hills and, and into the valley. I've already done enough. No, he didn't say that. He said, I'm going to build another altar. Right. Because if God got me through Sycam, he can get me through Hai. If we're going to be the friends of God, if we're going to be making it through burdens, if we're going to have a hand holding on to the teacher, if we're going to get through, we're going to have to build the altar. When the devil says it's not worth it, you just remind him because he's a quitter doesn't mean you're going to be. He's the one that threw it away and hell was created for him. Don't you throw it away because hell will not close its mouth for you either. Hell's only going to close its mouth for you when you continue building your altars, when you continue worshiping God, when you continue walking. Many people get stuck, but it's not a time to get stuck. It's not a time to get stuck. A lot of people put their life on hold. It's not a time to put life on hold. You already had your life on hold too often and too many times. It, it's amazing to me that men go through this thing called midlife crisis. You know, one of the first complaints they have is, I'm 50 years old and I've got nothing to show for it. And it's a crisis in their life. What about being faithful to God? Who cares if you own the mansion or the fancy cars? Be faithful to God. Be a soul winner. If you win one soul to God, you've already done more than the whole world has. Would you stand with me this morning? Abraham's, he, he's pretty old right now. And the only thing he's done with his life is build idols. He hasn't reproduced anything but idols. He hears the voice of God. Do you think he's going through a crisis? He's probably in his 70s or 80s right now. And the only thing he's ever done is build idols for other people to worship. And now here he is on a journey that he never intended to ever make. It probably confused him about every hour of the day walking across the desert. He's probably checking the wind. Am I going to the right place? I don't know where I'm going. But he's found a spot in his life that says, I'm sick of building idols for other people to worship. I've got to finally follow God. And so instead of building idols for others to worship, he's building altars to find his own direction. You and I are incredibly blessed today. We're incredibly, incredibly blessed. Because we have had the opportunity of an altar all our lives.
We were raised with the name of Jesus. We may not have understood it. We may have only heard it cursed. We may have only heard it degraded. But we knew it. We've heard the name of Jesus. We were raised with grace and mercy. And here we are. 2015 coming racing to a close racing to an end and what do we have if you have nothing you have an altar if you can't point to a deep pocket or a fat wallet or a secure job or a a home to live in or a vehicle to drive, if you can't point to any kind of earthly security, you have an altar. You find your place between a burden, right in the midst of a burden, there's a teacher there. You find yourself always walking out of the house of God into a ruins. We need an altar, don't we? We have an altar. Would you come around the altar this morning? We have an altar. Now I'm going to ask that we don't just take five minutes. I'm going to ask that we kneel. If, would, would, if you would, just, just find a place and kneel down. Floor, floor's padded. Feel free to kneel out in the middle. It doesn't matter. If you need a chair to kneel on, it doesn't matter. Just find a place to get down. Abraham, Abraham gathered stones. Now, we're not going to send you outside gathering stones this morning, but I'm going to ask you, would you, in your voice right now, would you gather some stones? Start building an altar around you? Start gathering some stones. Maybe, may, maybe one stone is going to be your past. And you're, you're, you're going to put a fire on it. May, maybe one stone is going to be your finances. Maybe one stone is going to be you're confused. You don't know what direction to go. You don't know what life holds for you. Maybe one stone is regret. You've, you've done some things and you... You can't get rid of this guilt, this monster that keeps reminding you. And you have regrets and you're struggling with that and you're trying to figure out how, how do you live with regrets. Well, you don't. You, you have to throw them down. You have to you put that stone right here. You can, you can pray through regret. You don't have to carry it. But the, the only thing you can't the only thing you can't burn up on this altar is your responsibility. You can't burn up your responsibility. You're, you're going to rise from the altar and you're still going to carry your responsibilities. But see, you're going to you're going to throw down those things that that you don't have to be responsible for. Your struggles and and, and, and anger in a lot of cases you're just going to have to put anger on this altar frustration and pain and the things that have been been pounding you and breaking you you've got to put them on the altar but when you rise, you're going to have the responsibility of your family a lot of times. And you're still going to be responsible to be a good steward with the finances that you have. And you're still going to carry responsibility. So, so you're throwing down the burdens that, that you're not supposed to be carrying. And you're standing up with the burdens that God is going to give you the victory and the strength to carry. He doesn't want you carrying the unnecessary that's the stuff Abraham said. I've got to lighten my load. I've got to lighten my burden. I've got to, I've got to get some things off my back. Get the monkey off your back this morning. 
and call on the name of Jesus Christ. Allow the hand of God to rest upon you. Allow the mercies of God to wash over you. Allow the strength of God to to lift you up and to, to carry you. Because he won't remove your responsibilities, but he'll remove your struggles. He'll remove the things that are no good for you. Oh, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, put those rocks in place, church. Put those rocks in place. Put those rocks in place. This is, this is how you need to pray every day. You need to build that altar. You need to put those stones in place, those rocks in place that say, I'm not carrying this. I'm not carrying this. I'm not carrying this frustration because, because, hallelujah, hallelujah. When the Spirit of the Lord comes on you, it's going to be a fire that's going to consume the sacrifice. It's going to char the stones. The stones on the altar are always looking. They've got the charred look. They, you can tell that they've been in the fire. You can tell that they're not just polished by the rain and the snow and the, and the streams coming down through the mountains. There's a soot. There's a burning. There, there's sometimes there's stuff sticking to them because God is going to get, meet you at this altar. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Come on, let this altar be a safe place for you today.